As Flies to Whatless Boys is billed as a historical novel, but it's much more than that. It's an adventure story in the tradition of the sea tale told with lots of comedy and pathos. In addition to that, it's a passionate romance. It's a family saga. It's a father and son story, and ultimately it's a coming of age story. It tells the tale of my family's immigration from London to Trinidad in 1845 as part of the Tropical Immigration Society. The harebrained scheme of an inventor, visionary, and bullfish charlatan, John Adolphus Etzler. He claimed to have invented machines powered by the immense forces of Mother Nature that would basically transform the tropics into an English garden virtually overnight. Etzler had lots of machines, but there were two main ones. His wind-powered satellite performed all the labor on the land. It would flatten mountains, clear the forests, drain swamps, prepare the fields. His wave-powered naval automaton was his universal water machine. It would turn paddle wheels or propellers hoist in the anchor, pump out the bilge, basically anything at sea. But Etzler and his machines only occupy the background of the novel. The foreground belongs to my narrator, Willie Tucker, who at middle age is recalling back to the time when he was 15 years old and made this voyage with his family aboard the Rosalind. Willie focuses, first of all, on his passionate head over heels fall for the enthralling and wise Marguerite Whitechurch. Marguerite comes from the gentry, so she's a world away from his own laboring class. Once they arrive in Port of Spain, Willie must part from Marguerite and travel with the men of the society to a hastily purchased estate on the most remote part of Trinidad's rugged north coast, basically a swamp called Chagua Barriga, or Belly of Mud. Only disaster strikes at the settlement. Uh, the pioneers never even get a chance to unpack their satellite, Etzler's machine, that will mow down the forest and plant their first crops. Within weeks, the majority of them, including Willie's father, are stricken with a dreaded black vomit. And now they're trapped without a boat to return to civilization. I want it to be as bold, as daring, as far-reaching and expansive as, you know, Etzler's own vision. Basically, I wanted it to live up to Etzler's madness. To me, the most basic definition of a novel is a community of voices, and I want to hear each of them individually, in my ears and on the page. It's my great pleasure as a writer. A website containing real documents, manipulated documents, fabricated documents. The films are atmospheric. They are evocative. They're not informational. The novel doesn't depend on them. And I'm interested in how they'll change the way we read, how they'll inform and embellish the reading process. It's allowed me to present to the reader Etzler's own patents in the midst of their reading, to give the reader William's notebook from 1845, an actual historical document, including his hand drawings and sketches. Some of those documents are real documents. Some of them are manipulated and others are, are invented. All of that, you know, allows me to, to uh, expand the confines of the novel, to go beyond its borders. I think of myself as embracing the tr traditional form of the novel. I love the idea of, you know, an old um, storyteller by a campfire on a bench looking at the sea. But at the same time, I would like to shake that up. <laughs>